Hello, and welcome to the broadcast of the live case of the month series with Intellis Medical. I'm Jamie Hoffman with the Training and Education Department. I will be your on-site moderator for today's live case. Before we get started, I want to go over the flow of how things will work today as well as a few housekeeping items. This section is pre-recorded. We will then be followed by a pre-recorded section of the physician speaking about their patient's history and the treatment plan for today and any other pertinent information. We will then move into the live broadcast for today. You will note that we've enabled the chat function for this broadcast. To the right of the video player, you will see the chat window. To ask a question, please type your name, the state in which you preside, and the question, and then hit submit. I will do my best to pose your question to the doctor as the procedure flows. However, I may not get to all your questions, and I apologize in advance if we do not answer your question. We will now move to the pre-recorded section of the physician talking about their patient's history and their treatment plan for today. Thank you for joining us for our live broadcast. Hello, I'm Bart Knox with Colorado ENT and Allergy. I've been in practice in Colorado Springs for 24 years after finishing residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the patient we're going to be treating today. He's a 55-year-old gentleman who's had nasal and sinus problems all of his adult life. He's on antibiotics approximately five times a year for sinusitis, generally augmentin, sometimes fluoroquinolones. He's been on intranasal steroid sprays. Uh, he was hospitalized a few years ago for IV antibiotics uh, for acute frontal sinusitis. He's never had nasal or sinus surgery. He was on immunotherapy for five years for allergic rhinitis and continues to have problems with chronic nasal congestion, facial pressure, and rhinosinusitis. So this is the patient's CT scan. Um, we're looking at the coronal view here and orientation is such that the patient would be looking at us. For instance, his right eye is on this side, on the left side, the left eye would be on the right hand side. The frontal sinuses um, show a little bit of mucosal thickening inferiorly and into the frontal nasal recesses. We can also see that on the, the uh, sagittal view below. As we work from anterior to posterior, uh, the anterior ethmoid air cells are, are pretty good. A little bit of mucosal thickening on the left, but that's pretty minimal. He has very narrow maxillary sinus ostea bilaterally with mucosal thickening in the maxillary sinuses, um, worse on the right side, a little bit on the left as well. Um, continue to go back uh, further posteriorly, there's an opacified posterior ethmoid air cell on the right side, and the sphenoid sinuses are clear. So these are the primary CT findings. Um, patient's ready, and here we go. Welcome to our friends and colleagues in Scottsdale and also viewing elsewhere across the country and at the Broadmoor Hotel here in Colorado Springs. Uh, this is my assistant Amada who's going to be helping us with the procedure this evening and our patient Ron. Uh, in the sake of saving time, we've done some pre-anesthetizing uh, pre um, uh, to help uh, move things along a little bit. Um, Amada, can you hand me the scope? We've packed our patient Ron's nose with cottonwood pledgets saturated with um, a one-to-one -one mixture of one percent, uh, one-to-one -one mixture of uh, one-to-one 1, thousand epinephrine and four percent topical lidocaine. The cottonwood pledgets are cut uh, about a centimeter long so we can uh, place them pretty precisely and at this point I'm going to go ahead and take them out of the right side of Ron's nose. We'll put them back in the solution. I'm using a 14 centimeter by 3 millimeter scope to look in Ron's nose. The scope is fairly narrow so it helps us work around uh, the nose a little easier. At this point I'm going to go ahead and do some injections with 1% um, lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. What I'll do is I'll inject kind of at the root of the middle turbinate. Ronnie you might feel a little pinch here. 
Doing okay? Mm-hmm. And then we'll inject along the body of the middle turbinate. Try to get a little bit lateral here in the insonate process. And then we'll take a freer elevator and medialize the middle turbinate just a little bit. I'll defog my scope. So pushing the middle turbinate medially to see the posterior attachment of the middle turbinate. Um, and we'll do an injection there as well. At this point I'm using, it's the same solution, 1% uh, lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine with a 25 gauge spinal needle. We'll try to uh, inject the middle turbinate a little bit. We'll try to medialize it a little bit more. See that uh, freer again, Amata? <clears throat> to get back into the sphenopalatine uh, ganglion. And that will provide more anesthesia as well as vasoconstriction. Injecting along the posterior attachment of the middle turbinate. Good. <clears throat> and at this point, we'll put the pledgets back in the nose. And again, these are cottonwoods cut down to about a centimeter long, soaked in 1 to 1,000 epinephrine mixed with 4% topical lidocaine. Try to put them pretty precisely. I start by putting some in the middle meatus. If I'm going to dilate a sphenoid sinus, I'll also put one back between the middle terminate and the septum back in the sphenoethmoid recess. I try to put them back along the uh, middle meatus to anesthetize and give us a little more vasoconstriction. Now I'll put some along the uh, body of the middle turbinate. And then also along the inferior turbinate as well. So that's sort of our anesthesia technique. The left side of his nose has already been done. So I'm going to take the cottonwood pledges out of the left side and go ahead and start uh, the dilatation process. Um, Amada, can you hand me the um, path assist? So this is the Intellis lighted path assist that we use um, to find the frontal nasal recess. If you can see on the device, it's got one centimeter and two centimeter markings. Let's see if we can find those. A little bit hard. Does, um, this kind of, can you wipe that off for some mana and kind of clean it so we can see that the marking is just a little bit. So here's the left side of the nose, vasoconstricted and anesthetized. Let's see if we can see the markings here. It's still a little bit hard to see with the light, but there's a one centimeter and two centimeter marking. I think we'll see it better when we get in the nose. But what we'll do is we'll go into the middle meatus, push the middle terminate a little bit medially, and find the insonate process, which is right here. Go just behind the insonate process in the infundibulum, and head straight up. And oftentimes you have to go up and then angle laterally just a little bit to get to the frontal, uh, frontal nasal recess and frontal sinus. 
But at this point, there's a two centimeter marking on the path assist. We're there and we can see the frontal sign is transilluminated. So I'm going to come out with the path assist. Monica, can you hand me the uh, device? Go ahead and pull the tab. So we're going to use the um, Intellis Low Profile Express 6 millimeter by 18 millimeter um, device, and I'm going to go in the same orientation right behind the Ensenate process. And you can see there's the one centimeter mark. Here's a two centimeter mark. I'm staying anterior to the bull ethmoidalis. And you should be able to go up to the two centimeter mark. And at this point, I'm going to take the scope out of his nose and we'll see the transillumination in the forehead. I'm going to advance the light just a little bit. And it's fairly tight. Uh, I don't have much much if any lateral excursion. I'm going to pass the balloon over the device now spanning the frontal nasal recess and we're going to inflate the balloon in just a second. Ron, at this point you're probably going to feel some pressure and hear some cracking noise. So go ahead, Amanda. I'll leave it inflated for about five seconds. And then we'll go ahead and deflate it. And at this point, typically we like to go a little more distal into the recess and into the frontal sinus, and we'll inflate it one more time. So, Ron, you um, might feel some pressure and hear some cracking again. Go ahead. Okay, come down. And we'll do a third dilation, a little more proximal, one more time. Okay, come down with the balloon. Now I'm going to withdraw the balloon. And at this point, we can still see the transillumination in the forehead, and we have quite a bit of lateral excursion, which tells us that the sinus is, is nice and open. And what we'll do is I'm going to change the scope over to a 30 degree. This is a zero degree scope. I'm going to put a 30 degree scope on it and just see if we can see into the frontal sinus. How are you feeling, Ron? Wow. That's different. Okay. Feeling okay? Yep. I'm going to go put that scoop right over there. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go back uh, in the same place. Now we can see way up into the frontal sinus, nice and open. Wide open, see way up in there. So that's what we want to see after we dilate the frontal sinus. Now we're going to put the zero degree scope back on. I'm going to go ahead and take the pledges out of the right side of Ron's nose. And I should mention that when we're doing this, we always start with the frontal sinuses, if you're going to do frontal sinuses. Um, the device comes out at about a 70 de 78 degree angle, the same angle um, that we use to get into the frontal sinus. So if you're doing multiple sinuses, including the frontal sinus, you always want to start with the frontal sinus because um, you don't want to bend it out of that orientation. Okay, so now since we did the left frontal sinus, we're going to go over to the right side. Pledgets are removed. I'm using that Intellis um, lighted path assist device like I did before, and I'm going to move the middle terminate just a little bit where I can see the unsonate process. I'm going to go right behind that. I'm going to stay anterior to the bulla ethmoidalis. And we're passing up, and now we can see the frontal sinus transilluminated. So I know which orientation to go. This, this device is also slightly 
smaller uh, at the tip and it tapers a little bit, gets a little bit thicker as it goes, so you can actually open that up just a little bit, which allows um, the low profile express balloon to get up there a little easier. So we're going in the same orientation up to the two centimeter mark. Um, and then we can see the transillumination in the forehead. I can advance this wire or the light actually a little further and you can see real nice transillumination of the frontal sinus. So we know we're in the frontal sinus by visualization, the two centimeter mark. We can feel it, we can see it with the light. Um, I don't have much lateral excursion because it's pretty tight. So what I'm going to do at this point is pass the balloon over the device. And in just, just a second we're going to inflate it. And Ron, at this point again you might um, feel some pressure and hear some cracking noise, okay? Mm -hmm. So go ahead and inflate it, Amana. Okay, down. I'm going to pass it a little further into the sinus. We're going to do it again. Okay, come down. And again, we're going to do a third dilation, just a little more proximal. Let's go ahead, Amada. Okay, come down. So now at this point, um, we're going to test that excursion again. And we have, I can move it wide, you know, wide excursion, move it all over the place here. So it makes us feel like we have it nice and open. And also, what I'm going to do is change over to a 30 degree scope again, and we'll take a peek up there. So there's really five ways that we can tell we're in the frontal sinus. We can see it with the scope. We can see it with the two centimeter marking on the device. Um, we can feel it with the lighted path assist and the uh, express device. We can transilluminate it. Uh, so we're going to take a look now with our 30 degree scope in the same orientation and we can see the sinus is wide open up there. Hopefully everybody can see that. We'll clean it just a little bit. A little harder to see on this side, but you get to feel it's nice and open. Um, let's go back to the zero scope. So in Ron, we're not doing um, sphenoid sinus dilation, but what I'd like to do is show you what I would do to get back to the sphenoid sinus if we were doing that. Um, again, we're going back to the zero degree scope. And at this point, I'm going to use the Intellis Sphenoid Sinus Seeker. It's an instrument that's uh, got a slight bend uh, at the end to help us get into the sphenoid sinus ostium. The other end is a, is a freer that helps us move some tissue around if we need to. So going back into the left side of Ron's nose, I'm going to use the freer side at this point. Just at this point, I'm going to lateralize this middle turbinate a little bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the seeker end and palpate along the sphenoid rostrum. And you'll typically find the sphenoid sinus ostium just inferior and medial to the superior turbinate. See if we can find it over here. It just kind of drops in there. Just Dr. Knox, we have yeah. a question from a viewer. Sure. Um, did you use any pre-sedation on this patient? Yes, that's a good question. Um, Ron had 10 milligrams of Valium and two Norcos about, uh, about two hours ago, actually. So now what we would do is we, we found the sphenoid sinus ostium. 
and we're not going to dilate him, but I'll just kind of show you what we would do. We pass this in the same orientation, and we pass it into about the one centimeter mark, which is right there, and inflate the balloon. And I'd pass the balloon over the device, and then inflate the balloon if we were going to dilate, but not necessary in, in this case. So I'm coming back out. Um, let's show them the, the tool that we use to bend the instrument. I'm going to lay the scope down for a minute, but we use the same instrument for frontal, sphenoid, and maxillary sinuses. There's a bender here, and after we do the frontal sinuses, uh, Amata will bend this to uh, the sphenoid sinus configuration. Now we're going to do maxillary sinuses, so Amata, can you bend it for us to the maxillary configuration? Good. Okay, thank you. Let you hold that. I'll go back with the scope. So now we're going to do maxillary sinus dilation. Um, in doing this, I use the Intellis um, maxillary sinus seekers. This is a 120 degree angle. There's one that's 135, but I, I prefer to use 120 degree. Um, as we go into the nose with our scope, um, again, I'm going to push the middle turbinate a little more medial towards the septum. Here's the insonate process. I like to go with the tip down, and I go as high as I can into the middle meatus, right up sort of into the crotch of the middle turbinate, and then rotate this tip over. You'll find the maxillary sinus ostium at about a 120 to 150 degree angle, and typically you go down kind of low, uh, the lower third, I'd say, of the infundibulum, but you one nice thing about this is you can palpate the ostium, so I can feel that I'm in there. And I'll kind of dilate it just a little bit with this instrument. And I will come back out, rotate it back over. So now our device is bent to that essentially that same angle. It's actually bent to about 135 degrees, so sometimes we have to unbend it just a little bit. Um, the arm is about almost 11 millimeters long to get into the maxillary sinus. So I'm going to go up in as high as I can and then rotate it over. So we're into the maxillary sinus ostium. I'm going to pass the balloon over the guide. It's pretty tight, but you can, you can feel it in there. And so in just a second, we're going to inflate the balloon. Ron, at this point, you might um, feel some pressure and hear some cracking. Go ahead, Amata. You can see it displaced the insonate process a little bit, dilating the infundibulum and the maxillary sinus ostium. So again, we'll leave it inflated for about five seconds or so, and then we'll deflate. I'm going to push it a little more posterior into the bulla, and we'll inflate one more time. Okay. Down. And then I'm going to pull it just a little bit more anterior, pull an unsnake process towards me just a little bit, and we'll inflate it one more time. Come down, Amata. Good. So I'm pulling the balloon back. And at this point, one thing I like to do is just sort of see how much space I have to rotate the device behind the insonate process. We have a lot more space there in the infundibulum. Really open that up quite a bit. So now I'm going to come out. Um, We'll do the same thing on the other side. Again, this is a 120 degree Intellis maxillary sinus seeker. 
pushing the middle turbinate towards the septum. I'm going as high as I can here up uh, sort of at, to the root of the middle turbinate and then I'm going to rotate this and get behind this uncinate process and then we drop down inferiorly and there it goes. And you can feel it kind of go into the maxillary sinus osteum. Come back out. Another thing I should mention too, when I do maxillary and sphenoid sinuses, I actually take the light out and we hook up a suction, uh, use a suction instead of the light because I just don't find the light to be helpful and the suction can be very helpful. I'm, um, you can suction some mucus out of the sphenoid or maxillary sinuses. So now we're in the maxillary sinus osteum. I'm going to pass the balloon over the device. And we're going to inflate in just a second. Ron, you might um, feel some pressure and hear some cracking at this point. Let's go ahead, Amanda. Okay. okay, down. Now we're going to position this a little more posterior into the bulla ethmodalis just a little bit. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, down. And we're going to do a third one. And again, I'm pulling the uncinate process towards me, a little more anterior. And we'll do a third dilation here. Okay, good. You can come down with that. So we'll draw the balloon. Rotate the device out. And see how much space we have back there. So now we can easily pass it behind the uncinate process, really opening that infundibulum and maxillary sinus osteum. So I'm going to remove the device. Ron, how are you feeling? Good. I'm going to clean the scope just a little bit. So now I'm going to open Ron's ethmoid a little bit on this right side to try to at least get that isolated um, posterior ethmoid air cell on the right side. So Ron, let's go with um, just a regular suction and I'll use a Blakesley to start. Uh, let me start with a Blakesley actually. Okay, so at this point I'm going, I'm still on the right side of the nose. Um, for orientation purposes, this is the middle turbinate, the insinate process. This is the bulla ethmoidalis and I've got a straight Blakesley I'm just going to bite into the bulla ethmoidalis a little bit. Take out some tissue. We don't have to do a real extensive ethmoidectomy here. I just really want to get that isolated posterior cell open. You see the suction? Y'all able to see that? We got some muca pus out of there. We'll open that more widely. You see a you see a straight through cut. Dr. Knox, if you yeah. would notice that you're not wearing gloves for this procedure, is that uh, yeah, how you typically, typically approach them? No, I mean I typically wear gloves. I um, this isn't a sterile procedure. I'd wear gloves to protect my hands as much as anything. Yeah, but I, I typically do. Suction. Typically, wear a pair of non-sterile examining gloves. Oh, 
on, how are you feeling? Okay. Been good? Okay, so at this point, the section's plugged, I think, Amada. Let me see, can I see a straight Blake sling? A little bony fragment right here. Let's hook up the micro breeder. I'm going to come out with the scope and clean the tip. So now we've opened up his right ethmoid, some anterior cells, and opened up into the right posterior ethmoid. I'm going to kind of polish it a little bit with a four millimeter um, blade on, a, on our micro breeder. I think we hit the spot. Ron, we're getting a carry of some pus out back here. When I'm doing this in the office, I am always uh, kind of struck at how dry the ethmoid dissection is compared to doing one in the operating room. And another thing, when we do um, ethmoidectomies in conjunction with balloon sinus dilation, I try to um, preserve the insinate process. So I'm working kind of behind and um, Density process preserving that structure. There's the pus. Good. So at this point, um, he's got a pretty open ethmoid cavity. We've got the disease out. I don't feel compelled to do a real thorough dissection because the CT findings really. We're limited to that spot. I'm going to come out and clean the scope. Let's change it to a two millimeter blade armada. So at this point, I'm going to finish up by doing some um, reduction of his inferior turbinates. Ron, I'm going into the left side of your nose. One injection here. This is, I'm going to balloon the turbinate just a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to use a sickle knife. Make a little incision anterior and inferior on the inferior turbinate. Just basically just doing a turbinate reduction like you all would do in the operating room. Pretty, pretty much the same thing. So I'm using a two millimeter blade. You can use a three or whatever, whatever you prefer. Some people like to coblate the turbinates. But here I'm doing a powered reduction. I don't mind getting a little opening of the mucosa back there because it allows for a little egress of some bleeding and um, 
I think it kind of helps in that regard. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll take the freer and try to lateralize the rest of the turbine. You might feel some pressure here, Ron. I'll push that over a little bit. We got a question from the group in Scottsdale. If you could review your anesthesia protocol one more time. Sure. Um, first of all, I'll pre-medicate my patients with uh, typically with Valium, 10 milligrams, and two Norco. Have them take that about an hour and a half before. And then when they come into the office, um, you know, check them in, and then we spray them down real good with Afrin and 4% topical lidocaine. And then after they're sprayed down, we uh, typically bring them back to the procedure room at that point. And the first thing I'll do is put the cottonwood pledges in their nose. Um, and again, their cottonwoods, I cut them down to about a centimeter long. And they're soaked in a one-to-one -one mixture of one-to-one 1 thousand epinephrine and 4% topical lidocaine. I'll put them in the middle meatus. If I'm doing sphenoids, I'll put them back uh, in the sphenoethmoid recess. I'm going to come out and clean my scope. And I'll put them along the uh, inferior turbinate. And if, I'm, if there's a septal deflection, I'll put them along the septum as well. Sometimes I'll even inject a septum. So I'll put those in um, on one side, and then I'll put the same pledgets uh, in the opposite side. Usually by the time I have the opposite side packed, I take the pledgets out of the first side of the nose and start my injections. And I'll inject with 1% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. And, um, usually inject along the root of the middle turbinate, along the body of the middle turbinate. Um, I try to get an injection along the insinate process. And uh, then I'll medialize the middle turbinate and inject the sphenopalatine area where the middle turbinate attaches posteriorly. After I do the injections, I pack the nose again with the cottonoids, take the cottonoids out of the opposite side and do the injections on that side. See the free armada. I'm going to come out and clean my scope. Another question from the group at the Broadmoor. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider doing a procedure like this on a hemophiliac? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I don't know that I'd be necessarily comfortable doing it on a hemophiliac. I will say, though, that I've done quite a few on patients that are on Coumadin. In fact, I have um, three cases tomorrow to do uh, on patients on Coumadin, and they do very well. They, uh, the bleeding is just about the same as what you see here. Okay, now I'm just, basically I'm done with the procedure. I'm gonna section out Ron's nose and take a good look around. Here's the ethmoid cavity on the right side. We got that, um, muco pus out of there. Front, this is a zero degree scope, but you can still see into the frontal nasal recess a little bit. Um, here's the insinate process. Let's look on the left side. Of course, we did not do um, an ethmoid on the left side, but um, frontal nasal recess would be right up here. It's hard to see with the zero degree scope. That's process processes here. And we're done. I'm coming out with the scope. Ron, how are you feeling? It's a lot different. Can you feel better? Yeah. Can you breathe? Yeah. Great. I'm going to take this drape off of you. Good. 
to you. Okay, I'm just going to hold this under your nose in case you drip a little bit. I don't think you'll bleed much, but just in case it does, I'm going to hold this under your nose. I'm going to raise your chair up a little bit. Okay. How do you feel? It's like my wife said. I was told the other people who had it that you'll feel like you've been walking around stuffed up all the time. So it feels better? Yeah. Breathe better? Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, thanks for letting us do that. And uh, I can uh, walk around out. I'm happy to answer any questions. I can um, answer questions now or in just a minute if, uh, if there are any to, to address. Well, I'm going to hang on for a couple of minutes and see yeah. if there's any questions. Okay. Ron, if you want, I can walk you back here. And Good. I'll be right back. Feel okay? Yep. Good. Viewers asking if you asked the patient what the what their pain score was for that procedure. I didn't ask him that specifically, but when I was walking him out and down the hall, he just really just said that was amazing, and he feels great. And that's you know that's a, that's pretty typical. We we don't see a lot of pain from it. If well, you'd be so kind as to review the anesthesia one more time, sure. please. I do, but um, if somebody would please let me know if the Dallas Cowboys draft a new general manager, I'd be interested in that too. But um, So my anesthesia protocol, um, I pre-medicate the patients with 10 milligrams of Valium and two Norco about an hour and a half before the procedure. When they come in to the office, the first thing we'll do is spray them with Afrin and 4% topical lidocaine. You know, do it a couple of times. And uh, then we bring them back to the procedure room. Just take our time, um, make them comfortable in the chair. I cover their eyes with a, kind of a moist, um, cool four by four, and just have them close their eyes and darken the room. And then I'll look in their nose with the scope and take the cottonwood pledge. It's, again, I cut them down to about a centimeter long. I think that's helpful. And they're soaking in a one-to-one -one mixture of one to 1,000 epinephrine and 4% topical lidocaine. And then I'll place the pledgets. Um, I start in the right side. That's, I just kind of always do it that way. And I'll put the pledgets in the middle meatus along the middle turbinate. If I'm doing a sphenoid, I'll put them back in the sphenoethmoid recess. I'll lay them along the inferior turbinate. And if there's a septal deflection, I'll put them along the septum as well. And then um, after I do the right side, I go to the left side and I'll put the cottonwood pledgets um, in the same location. Usually by the time I pack the left side, I can come back to the right side and take the pledgets out and inject with 1% lidocaine with, with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. And then I inject along the root of the middle turbinate and then along the body of the middle turbinate. Um, and I try to get a lateral injection along the insonate process. Uh, I'll inject along the inferior turbinate a little bit. And if there's a subtle deflection, I'll inject that. And then I'll try to medialize the middle turbinate a little bit and inject back into the sphenopalatine uh, area where the uh, middle turbinate attaches posteriorly. And then after I do my injections, I put the cottonwoods back in the nose and then I go to the opposite side and do the same thing. A couple more questions. Um, a, if you could speak up a little more for the large group in Phoenix, they're having some trouble, or Scottsdale are having oh, okay. some trouble hearing you. Um, have you ever used a debreeder to take down a septal spur? Uh, I have. Um, I have used a debreeder to, t to take down a septal spur. Actually, um, 
I found that we can be pretty aggressive in doing septoplasties. And what I, what I prefer to do now is just make an incision through the mucosa anterior to where the deflection of the spur is. And I'll raise a flap with a caudal elevator and um, sort of perforate the uh, bone or, or make an incision through the cartilage, wherever it may be, and then raise a flap on the opposite side and use um, our Blake's knees or through cut forceps to remove the deviation of the spur. But I have used a, a microdebreeder to do that as well. Follow-up question, do you use the same anesthesia protocol when you do septo, septo work? I do, um, and I found that to be very adequate. I'll, of course, I'll inject the septum pretty thoroughly, but um, other than that, everything's the same. Clearly, you did an excellent job with the Intellis devices. Um, a physician in Scottsdale wants to know what your learning curve was like and how long did it take you to get comfortable with this? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think the learning curve is, is um, it's pretty easy, honestly. I think the equipment to use is, is really simple and intuitive and easy. Um, we're used to using uh, instruments like that in the operating room, you know, the probes when you're probing sinuses or, or whatever, and you have that tactile feedback. Um, so I found um, that it was really quick to become comfortable using the equipment. A follow-up to your, question, your uh, answer on the Coumadin patients, do you make any adjustments to your anesthesia protocol when treating patients on Coumadin? I don't. Um, I use the same anesthesia protocol. Um, I will check a pro time if they haven't had one recently just to make sure they're not, their INR is not way out of whack. Um, so and I use the same protocol. Um, another thing I do is I'll prescribe um, prednisone and antibiotics and have them start 40 milligrams of prednisone a day for five days and start that the day before and start an antibiotic the day before. The, about the only time I vary from that is if someone's diabetic, which in fact this gentleman was, so I did not have him take prednisone. And then a question about kind of the extent of the work that you're willing to do in the office. Um, do you frequently do ethmoid work and how about polyps? Um, yeah, I, that's a good question too. I do, um, I found I do just about everything in the office and um, I've done pretty extensive polyp cases. I've done quite a few over a dozen ethmoidectomies. Um, done revision work in the office. Um, so yeah, I, I do do just almost all of my nasal and sinus stuff in the office. Okay, and in, in terms of the logistics of performing office procedures, how many do you do in a day? How do you schedule them? What's, what is the timing? Um, you know, that's variable. I do most of mine on Fridays, um, but some of my partners will do them different times during the day. You can have a clinic, uh, be seeing patients, and schedule one during a break. Um, I allow about an hour, hour to an hour and a half per case. And I think if you're starting off, I would allow a little more time, maybe an hour and a half. And I think that in most cases, that's plenty of time. Need a little bit of uh, time for room turnover. Um, but that's just, you know, I think it's just whatever works best for your schedule. But certainly it's something that's easy to do um, in a procedure room when you're seeing patients in the office. You mentioned how dry these ethmoidectomies are during the office procedures. Have you ever had an issue with bleeding in an office case? I haven't. Um, we do have a bovi that we could use if we needed to. I've never had to use it. Um, but what, what we saw tonight is really very typical. That's about how they typically look. Um, you know, under, under general anesthesia, they do bleed a lot more because of the vasodilatation from the anesthesia. But here in the office, they typically are, are just about like what we saw tonight. Another question from Scottsdale. When do you follow up with patients and how soon after the procedure before you allow them to go back to work? Um, I will typically try to see them back the following week and I tell the patients they can go to work the next day and um, that's, you know, that's, um, I think that's realistic and reasonable. In fact, I did uh, a case a couple of months ago, pan sinus disease, completely opacified sinuses, total ethmoidectomies, and she went to board meeting that night. So much, much easier recovery.
Good. Okay. Thank you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>